Two months. All right. Hello, everybody. As I already mentioned, my name is Ville Veikka-Pulk, and I work as researcher at the Finnish Social Insurance Institution, Kela. And I've been a member of this research group responsible for the Finnish uh, Basic Income Experiment Study. I gave my last presentation in Warsaw in June, and I had so bad icebreakers that I don't even try today, but I hope you will enjoy my presentation. And it's such an honor to be in Turku. I can say this since I'm not originally from Helsinki, so Turku is always a good place to be. As our uh, former foreign minister, I always have three points, and today, firstly, I'm going to talk about background for our study. Secondly, the essential findings and recommendations of our research group. And finally, hopefully something useful for our foreign guests, so how to plan a successful experiment. You may know that there is a policy process going on, and you may be interested in what is happening at ministry, but Currently, they are responsible for the communications, so I will concentrate just on our research today. And if you have some questions concerning the policy process, you better ask someone else. So, how, how did this whole process start? The starting point was a reference that was made in the, in the governmental program of Prime Minister Juha Sipila. I think not that many people expected to see this mention, since uh, the parties in this coalition government have not been advocating that uh, ambitiously basic income during the last years. Uh, this, this continued to a phase uh, when in autumn 2015, when after the evaluation, Kela, so my employer, was appointed to start a study on the suitability of different basic income models for the experiment. And this process continued approximately six months, and we published a preliminary study on 30th March 2016. And according to our contract, we are also going to publish a final report on 15th November 2016. And as far as I know, according to the current plans, uh, the basic income experiment is expected to be launched in January 2017. Our work was based on the assignment handed down by the Prime Minister's office, and this assignment outlined four different options. The first option was and is uh, so-called full basic income, which could basically replace all the other benefits, perhaps excluding earnings-related benefits, since they are at relatively high level in Finland. So, a full basic income which could replace those benefits would be really <coughs> expensive. The second choice was partial basic income, which is usually considered the basic income in Finnish discussion, so a model which could replace all those other uh, basic security benefits, but leave uh, especially earnings related benefits intact. Third choice was negative income tax, so politically determined minimum income, which would be paid just for those persons who cannot earn the income, minimum income themselves. It's not by definition the same as basic income, but the macro and micro level uh, implications would be pretty much the same. We also studied the new uh, British social security system called universal credit, and also uh, participation income uh, popularized by British economist uh, Anthony Atkinson. But if you, want to, if you want to test the basic income, then it needs to be unconditional, and these schemes are not. So in the same assignment, government uh, emphasized one, one clear target, and that was diminishing these incentives in the current social security. In other words, uh, our government is interested to see if basic income has some kind of effects on employment. 
And according to my analysis, this could be interpreted as a continuation of the activation policies which have been pursued in Finland since the last two decades. So, government wants to see if uh, increasing labor supply has some kind of effect on employment. As at least the Finnish persons here know, currently we have a number of means tested benefits and uh, which are made in addition to each other and as a joint effect it results that there are different these incentives to participate labor markets. We can uh, divide these, uh, these incentives to economic ones which are unemployment traps and income traps usually in Finnish discourse and also psychological these incentives which we could call bureaucracy traps. So how we can measure these traps? If we start with unemployment traps, we mean economic in these incentives to participate uh, in labor markets. And the uh, end indicator for, for unemployment traps uh, is called participation tax rate. And when this is A B or higher, a person is considered to be in an unemployment trap. Uh, participation tax rate means how many percent it's your uh, cross salary is diminished by taxes, uh, lost benefits and uh, possible earnings related uh, service charges. The second economic trap is called uh, income trap. It means uh, that a person has economic disincentives to increase his or her workload. An indicator for this is so-called effective marginal tax rate. And when this is 70% or higher, a person is uh, considered to be in an income trap. And this uh, indicator tells you how many percent it's your gross salary is diminished uh, if, you, if you increase your workload. Then these psychological traps, so-called bureaucracy traps, which I personally consider a bigger problem than uh, the economic disincentives in our current system. This basically means, uh, because of the means testing, there are different delays reporting applications and in the worst case scenarios you can even fall through the social security net and these are um, especially problems for people who who work as a part-time basis or who would like to go into self-employment or combine self-employment and paid work here you, can, here you can see a list what we studied in the preliminary study I'm not going to discuss all these themes, but I think this slide might be useful, especially for our foreign guests. So I think all these aspects are good to take into account if you want to prepare a good basis for a basic income experiment. This is one of my favorite slides, and uh, I think the first lesson today might be that it is not well, it is problematic to discuss a basic income at a general level. So framing, framing makes difference. Uh, Kela carried out a survey last autumn, um, actually some surveys, and first people were asked, do you support basic income as such? And 69.3% of Finnish population answered yes, that it would be a very good idea or good idea. Then in a later survey, uh, different uh, flat rate taxes were combined with uh, different parcel basic income schemes and what happened was that the, the support collapsed. So this means, of course, I need to mention it's fair to note that the, these flat rate taxes, they don't actually increase your uh, effective taxation, so if you combine uh, taxation with uh, basic income you receive, your uh, net income wouldn't change at least drastically. So I think it might have happened that people thought that their effective taxation is going to be higher than uh, currently, and that's why to, uh, the support collapsed. But okay, this is of course speculation, but still I want to emphasize that framing. Framing is really important when talking about basic income. Here you can see some of our first micro simulations carried out by Berti Honganen and Miska Simonainen 
These are not, I think, the most accurate uh, numbers, but these show something with what kind of uh, levels, uh, what kind of tax rates might be uh, combined with different personal basic incomes and which are the effects on income distribution and poverty. Okay, it, it might be pretty obvious that higher the basic income, more equal income distribution and less poverty. But I think this is uh, a dynamics which everybody should know if we are talking about basic income. And this also, again, emphasizes the fact that there is no such thing as a general level basic income. If you want to tackle uh, income, income equality, then you will have different kinds of basic income. If you want to just improve uh, work incentives, then you will maybe uh, support different kind of model. So the essential findings which we made on this study, it was pretty clear from the beginning that the full basic income might be too expensive uh, even to test. As we can see, I will here, flat rate tax for 1,000 euros basic income would be 60% and for uh, uh, 1,500 euros it would be 79. Of course, uh, the micro-simulation models used have been based on uh, income taxation, which means that, of course, if we had some other components, environmental taxes, even uh, helicopter money, whatever. Of course, these uh, tax rates would be at a lower level. But we didn't have any political mandate to <laughs> build some kind of really political model. So this is kind of the base. And in the end, I think my opinion is that income taxation will be the basis for, for funding basic income if basic income will be implemented in the future. And this might be a little bit problematic if we think that the technological change might replace some workers. So in, in that case, income taxation won't be a sustainable solution for financing basic income. I think negative income tax would have been politically more feasible choice since it, it is not made universally for everyone. But before we have an, uh, access to real-time information of people's income, we cannot test negative income tax reliably. According to current information, uh, the Finnish government is going to implement a new digital system that we could follow people's income. And this, this would help also paying negative income tax for people. But we don't know if it's going to happen in 2019 or not. I'm pretty sure that no matter which government there's going to be, the new government or the future government will in, uh, use this new digital system to ease people to combine uh, work income and uh, other incomes. This is also one lesson that we <coughs> we can learn from the experiments in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they reported that people were actually saying that they worked less than they really worked. And this, this is also shown in the fact that the labor supply declined quite moderately, but it declined in these experiments in the 60s and 70s. I'm not saying that we should translate these results straight to the Finnish 2016 context, but these are some of the few uh, lessons we should take into account when launching uh, an experiment in Finland. Then the thing which I think <coughs> some of you are also saying that basic income works, makes work always pay. This is uh, at least half myth and uh, if we are talking about budget neutral parcel basic income, which means that no one's net income is allowed to change drastically. Basic income cannot make incentives, economic incentives, that much better. Uh, it results from the fact that the uh, flat rate, this flat rate tax is needed for 
budget neutral models requires relatively high taxation and I guess most of the advocates wouldn't like to remove, for example, housing allowance schemes, uh, additional social assistance or earnings related benefits. Of course, if you would replace all the other benefits, then work incentives would be better. Uh, this result was actually available or already in 2014 when the Green League analyzed their model. Uh, Oli Kärkkäinen and Oli Karnas, two economists, made the analysis on their model in the Finnish parliament and these same things were also concluded that participation tax rates or effective marginal tax rates do not uh, decline that much if if a basic a partial basic income and budget neutral par partial basic income is implemented. So in short strengthening economic work incentives means either uh, diluting the current level of social security or it costs. So if we would, if we, if we were implementing a basic income with progressive taxation, it wouldn't be that hard to make economic incentives better for especially low income households. But then it's a political question. A basic income is not an automatic mechanism, mechanism which would do this. So anyway, if you want to remove the disincentives effectively, effectively, you need to apply progressive taxes. Well, bureaucracy traps. Even though a partial basic income cannot uh, remove all the bureaucracy traps, uh, I think anyway, many delays and reporting applications would disappear and this would for sure help people to go into self-employment or work as a part-time base. And I think for myself personally this is this is what makes this experiment interesting. We don't really know yet what kind of model our government wants to test but no matter what kind of uh, model there's going to be, bureaucracy traps and effect of bureaucracy traps will be tested for sure. Here we can see some participation tax rates, so how much uh, people, uh, people's uh, gross salaries are diminished if they start to work. So from unemployment to employment. As you can see, there is no consistent improvement. There is some, but still if we look, uh, if you would get, let's say, 900 euros the situation wouldn't be that different in comparison to the current situation. And this is a person living alone, so it, it could be called a simple case. When economists usually talk about... I'm, by the way, a social scientist, and I, I've never talked this much about economic decisions and as this year. But, yeah, when economists are usually talking about these incentives, the, first case and the ideal case is uh, loan parent because, because uh, loan parents are of course getting more compensation for their uh, socioeconomic situation it makes also so they, they are getting better social security so this makes automatically also these tax rates higher and as we can see here these calculations show that the situation can even even get worse if uh, budget neutral partial basic income was implemented. Then, of course, if you if you were having from two thousand euros to three thousand euros, you, there would be some improvement, but still it wouldn't be that consistent. So the problem also here, if you want to make the economic incentives better for low-income persons. The easiest <laughs> choice is uh, easing those people's income taxation. So now I'm going to talk about an ideal research setting. It is quite possible that 
this is not going to be the setting that our government is able to test, but this is what we thought would be ideal. And uh, I think there's also some lessons which could be applied also in other countries. Uh, a lot of this work was uh, done by Joko Verhan, Kari Hämäläinen, and so I always want to mention the people, so, so that they, I don't get any angry calls afterwards when they <laughs> watch this on YouTube. So we recommended two pronged and compulsory randomization would, would produce reliable results. This means that the first priority would be an nationwide randomization, which would uh, be a representative sample, and that way produce generali generalizable results. Uh, we also recommend that this, this could be also combined with more intensive regional sample for examining so-called externalities. So external, this means, in short, what will happen if more people in certain region or in the same municipality are receiving a new benefit. Of course, a weighted sample is possible if you think politically that, let's say, self-employed people is a group that we are especially interested in, then we could also weigh this kind of um, socioeconomic group. And with the treatment group, it is of course necessary to have uh, control group, so people in the same kind of socioeconomic uh, situation. As everybody realized that it's impossible to find totally perfect um, control group for this kind of social experiment, but still this, uh, this should be emphasized and at least to try to find as, as good control group as possible. Public calculations are a measure to find out how big would be big enough sample. In our preliminary study, Jörg Verho calculated that a sample of 10,000 people would be big enough to observe statistically significant results if employment changes two percentage points. These, these are, of course, things which include many estimates, so this is not any absolute truth that it, it's 10,000 people which we need in Finland, but this was the first calculations made in this study. And I know that later, uh, afterwards, uh, our economists have done new calculations, and I think these will be applied when, when the government is going to publish their model. Uh, studying the whole, the entire uh, working population would be, of course, ideal. But since the budget also in this uh, experiment is limited, so it's right now it's 20 million for two years. It means that <coughs> it is wise to prioritize the groups which are uh, interesting in the sense of employment. So we recommend that it would be. Uh, wise to prioritize or focus on low-income earners to see because we were, it's quite expected that the people who, who, who are low-income earners that their labor supply estimate uh, their labor supply is more elastic than if you are receiving let's say 5,000 euros a month. Uh, we recommend it also to exclude <coughs> people under 25 years old, this is, I think this is uh, politically and also scientifically difficult question. Some of, some of the persons in our group thought that, okay, people, especially uh, so-called need youth, so youth who are not in uh, employment, education or training, might be in higher <coughs> risk of social exclusion if they would get, if they got uh, unconditional <coughs> money. I don't agree with this analysis, but okay, it's also an empirical question, and this is how our research group saw it. But the bigger reason for excluding these people was were, was that. Uh, if and when the government is using uh, the 
budget of my employer, so um, Kela. Uh, there are many people in this group which uh, do not receive any benefits currently. So, for example, people 18 years old, people living at home. So these people would use our 20 million euros budget more than some other people who might receive, might be, for example, 20 seven years old and unemployed and receiving some benefits. We talked that the parcel basic income would be the ideal model to test and it should correspond to the current level of the basic security benefits provided by Kela. We didn't have any political uh, mandate to to build a model which would make the social security worse in comparison to the current situation. But on the other hand, we didn't have a mandate that we should recommend, for example, a basic income of 1,500 euros. Of course, in an ideal research setting, and if, if the budget was unlimited, why not to test many kind of different models? This model, what we recommend, it wouldn't replace earnings-related benefits, housing allowance, or additional social assistance. And as I, um, as I mentioned, in an ideal test situation, why not to have any kind of different uh, levels and tax rates? Uh, Kela's <coughs> lawyers had done also a lot of work on the legal preconditions, especially under Pas Duovenen has been working long hours with these issues. And of course the main, main issue is the constitution of Finland and especially two, two issues within it which are the principle of non-discrimination. We are not sure if it's possible to firstly have a compulsory uh, obligatory sample and it may also limit the number of models, so we are not sure if we can give some people 700 euros, some people 600 euros. Another issue is the right to basic subsistence, so according to our lawyers it is quite clear that at least diluting the current level of social security would be problematic in that sense. It would strengthen the work incentives, economic work incentives, but on, on the other hand it would also increase poverty and income hardship. Uh, in my opinion, the basic security benefits are not that high level in Finland these days that this would uh, have any good results in, uh, if we are taking social issues into account. And in the last resort, it will be the Constitutional Committee which decides if the basic income experiment can be launched or not. I think this will happen in the end of this year, I'm not sure it's going to be November or December. Uh, many uh, experts have said that aim of assessing reforms required for societal improvements might be good enough reason for experimenting basic income. So let's hope. It. I think EU law is also one aspect that if you are testing the basic income it's not the main main thing you should be aware of. Of course, things like exportability of basic income. Can a person take a basic income abroad? How long? For how long time? And also, when a person uh, will be eligible for a basic income when moving to Finland? If basic income was implemented for whole population, these are things which should be should be solved, but the, in the experiment setting, uh, these, at least I think, can be tackled, what I've heard about our experts. This is actually already my last slide, and I think this is, I'm not criticizing our government with this slide, but uh, these are things what I've learned during the process and when I was reading a paper by Ron Heichel, a Canadian, Canadian researcher who led the experiment in Canada 74, 
1979 in Manitoba. He was emphasizing these same aspects, so I think these are quite universal good practices for testing a basic income. So as I mentioned already many times, <coughs> general level discussion of basic income is a pr is problematic starting point. And I think especially the targets needs to be defined. If the government says employment is the most important target, then we, we can uh, model different kinds of basic income in comparison to the government who is say, which is saying that we want to make income distribution much more equal. So this kind of uh, defining these kind of targets is a really important starting point for the study, but also for the whole process. Political commitment. I think it's at least uh, as crucial as uh, defining the targets, especially money and time. So before, during, and also after the experiment, researchers need to trust that they, they can do their work as well as possible. And I think this is, this, is, this is the biggest challenge since what we have also learned from the experiments in the, in the States and Canada in, in the 60s and 70s was that political commitment started to decline. And for example, in Canada, they were like really, I think the research group was 120 people at first. And in the end, there were just economists analyzing labor supply estimates. So the process, it's not just like budgeting money at first, but it's also commitment to even budget more money if needed, and also secure uh, decent analysis, analysis on the results. It is demanding process. There are a lot of different uh, players involved. It's not just politicians and researchers. There are also civil servants, tax administration. Uh, also, you need to find out how to pay the money for people. So payment, building a payment platform may be even, even harder, harder challenge than you can imagine. And if you are not aware of this, I think you, you won't have enough commitment to the experiment. So I trust that the, these are not a problem in countries like Iceland where, <laughs> where, where things happen more dynamically. And uh, if you can even get to the Euro games, you can do anything, I guess. <laughs> But uh, yes, I think no matter what size country, uh, what government, which parties, these are the things you need to keep in your mind to current the a good research on basic income. So my last sentence here, and my last point, which I think everybody who has been uh, preparing a basic income experiment would, would agree with me that the basic income experiment is not just an experiment. So if you want to test the basic income, you need to be committed that it is, it is not just an experiment. But I will finish my presentation here, and if you have any questions, please. Any questions for Villa Pulka? We have still a few minutes. Any notes there? Hello. So I'm Albert um, from Iceland, like you were pointing out. <laughs> I won't do the Viking clap or anything, <laughs> but uh, I saw from your figures that you were uh, that there are numbers like 54 to 64 percent tax uh, to make. Uh, 
everybody looked like a single mother, or was it? Or ah, yes, <laughs> for the best. Yes. <clears throat> no, yes. So, um, I'm just wondering, uh, isn't this going to just push the whole idea of the table, uh, that people uh, see this figure and they say, just no? Or, uh, and then the, the real question is, uh, what kind of benefits from these kind of basic income studies would uh, actually uh, counter this and make this uh, high tax rate um, uh, okay for people in the country? What kind of benefits would they have to get? Yeah, I think since the, with these budget neutral models, people's net incomes would not change drastically. I think the main benefits would be less bureaucracy. And I think this argument uh, in the context of technological change is quite crucial if you are advocating for work ethic and uh, the long history of activation policies which have been emphasizing uh, these incentives and work incentives. It's uh, now again a big topic inside the government, these, these incentives. I'm not sure if uh, these are the reasons why basic income should be implemented. I think there are a lot of people who have many arguments for basic income, not just economic. But of course, as I mentioned, this is just one way to apply taxation on basic income. And if you're interested on in low income earners, uh, work incentives, then it might be wise to make richer people to pay a little bit more than they are doing right now and then uh, lower the le income taxation level for, uh, for example, lone parents. <coughs> but yeah, I think uh, if we are talking just in the context of economic incentives or these incentives, then this kind of table could be pretty much a non-starter. Okay, <clears throat> I'm Joko Hemmi. I have one question to you. Uh, you talked about uh, the finance and the, the sample. You put out uh, uh, a target of uh, groups representing about 10,000 people. But now they are revolving some rumors that this uh, uh, money allocate, allocated already for, for the basic income experiment, that is only some 20, 30 million mar uh, euros. This is nothing to reach, for instance, this size of uh, target people as 10,000. How, how, uh, the, 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 I have read, read the article uh, English, in English uh, written by your colleagues. Yeah. And there was a suggestion that uh, this uh, money could be more if uh, Keller, the, the experiment uh, uh, organizers, organizers could, uh, could take the money from uh, social al allowances to cover the, 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 the rest of the money to, to, to cover this, to, to reach these 10,000 people. I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, perhaps uh, you understand what I mean. I, My English is not enough no, good. No, no, I think if you meant that the, if the current benefits could be used as a basis for the budget, then the sample could be bigger, which means that, okay, if you're, let's say, you're receiving labor market subsidy from Kela, it's five, approximately 550 euros. If this person is going to be included in the experiment, this 550 euros which this person is already receiving, it, it's, okay, it's coming just straight from the Kela budget, not from the experiment budget. So this, and uh, there has been already political decision that uh, this is how the government is going to go further. So they use the current benefit budget to improve the sample. Um, Sino Ruotinen, the chair of Basic Income Earth Network Finland. I have only one question about this age limit to cut out of the experiment of 
people under 25 years. Uh, how have your lawyers evaluated if this is not unconstitutional discrimination because people under 25 can be in equal position in the labor market, if that's one point, or in any other sense. And do you think cutting this group of people for some kind of problematic situations like giving extra money to someone who is not getting benefits, is this cutting this some party may think this is a problematic group. If it is cutting out this group from the experiment, it's just going to be a weapon for the people against basic income to tell that this experiment is not telling the right results because it's selected result. Yeah, so I think there will be many interpretations after the experiment. Media will destroy the results straight away. Politicians will destroy the results. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's also one lesson we, we know from the US. There's one anecdote. The first analysis showed that there were more divorces in the US. And that was a really big deal for that uh, conservative government those days. And that also was a tipping point that changed the support for the basic or negative income tax scheme. And later, afterwards, it was, <laughs> it was shown that these results were not even statistically significant. So they were totally useless results. But that already changed it. So there are a lot of these kind of uh, uh, factors that may affect the interpretation afterwards. And, uh, of course, it has to be said that this experiment, no matter in what form it will be implemented, will not tell the absolute universal truth on basic income. And I think what we can learn are some indicators, especially employment, if it's going to be done well scientifically, um, wise way that we may learn something on that but then maybe subjective well-being health indicators this might also tell us something but of course we need to be critical and uh, according what I know currently if it's going to be two years it's just two years it's not 20 years uh, there's, uh, there's a difference. I'm not sure how many people are straight away going to have a new business if they know that they get money for two years, unconditional support. But if you know that, okay, this will change the whole socioeconomic basis for being an entrepreneur, I think it might be different. But, yeah, we need to be critical, but we need to also try to do these things as as uh, reliable way as possible in scientific sense. All right. I think that's pretty much our time for the questions. Thank you very much. We'll have a couple of applause.